Hi, Tony Fretman. Thank you for being here. And uh, you founded your practice in 1982. In these years, you realized several projects um, uh, ranging from art galleries like the famous Lisson Gallery, museums, uh, exhibitions, to artists' houses like the one you designed last year for Anish Kapoor. Uh, what do you think to be the differences in designing a temporary space for art or instead a permanent house for somebody who produces art? Well, houses are... Um, they're not as clear in their program as a gallery. The gallery program is quite simple and singular, but in the house of Anish Kapoor, for example, it had to uh, handle um, uh, his family life, his uh, entertainment life, because as an artist he has uh, lots of people to come see him. And while it's just his house and not his studio, he will show work there as well. He has a collection, not only of his own work, but other artists such as Dan Graham. Um, so it's not different from an Italian palazzo. It has uh, representational qualities. A commercial art space is very singular. It's about selling work, so it, the rooms have to be rather, they have a retail quality. An art centre, such as the Camden Art Centre that we do, that we did, um, has a, quite a large um, social component. In the Camden Art Centre, it's not only the um, art program which is important, but also the fact that uh, people go there to uh, make art classes, amateur art classes. So on the one hand you have um, an Ad Reinhardt exhibition, on the other hand in the basement you have somebody making a huge bear out of clay, you know, so it's rather charmingly um, dispersed. But also, for me, the, perhaps the most important component is that in the Camden Arts Centre people just go there uh, on Sunday with their children because we were able to make a garden at the back which is very safe. And it's um, become a characteristic of art spaces, let's say since the Pompidou Centre, that it's not only about going to see art in a rather serious way, but art places have become um, places of sociability. And I particularly like that aspect. And the museum in Fulsang that we did, that's completely different. It has a permanent collection, which uh, extends from about 1750 to 1970, so it has lots of different types of art. That's fairly static, but it also has an exhibition program, which is usually wonderful. And um, it's in this fantastic site, uh, in the countryside. Uh, the land is, if you think Holland is flat, Denmark is transcendentally flat. It stretches as far away as the eye can see. And um, it's a, that's a real public venue. And this will perhaps amuse you. We designed it so that you arrived in a pure state and saw the countryside and all of the car parking was over here. And the first time that I arrived to see it, the area where you're supposed to see the beautiful view is full of vehicles for incredibly old people on Zimmer frames getting out there walking across the car park. So uh, life always, um, uh, always uh, makes its effect on what you do. Um, so there, there are three, there's several different aspects to making art. And also making art for, um, making architecture for um, uh, musical people like Anton Corbijn, who um, we spoke about earlier. Uh, I mean, that's slightly different because in, um, making an art gallery, you actually put, you make a space for the art objects, but for Anton, we made his studio, but it actually wasn't really a studio. He, he worked on location, so it was a place where he, it was his office, effectively. And um, he was, I was introduced to him through Daniel Miller, who's a great, a really a great man, director of um, Mute Records, all of those bands from the 70s and 80s, fantastic bands. Um, that was a wonderful world, but you know these things go away. That the, the thing about art is that it has a degree of permanence. Music's fantastically um, uh, temporary. And I just on the train, I was listening to um, uh, Joy Division, and um, 
<clears throat> I used to see them, you know, and um, I used to play, but very badly at the same time. Yes, so I know you were. You know, you know I did. I know well, you I'm were. never going to play you anything we recorded, so you'll be clear about that that's not going to happen. But what th this leads me to talk about the 70s and 80s in London when architecture in the world was just getting through postmodernism. So I was working in offices, commercial offices, um, doing working on truly horrible projects for very nice people. People are my friends now. But, um, and in the evenings, I was um, going to listen to The Clash and um, playing in the band and eventually being in a performance group. So how does that all work with the architecture? Well, it works because of a specific experience working with this um, performance company called Station House Opera, who are not widely known, but I saw this performance in a space a little like the, the one we're in, and it was amazingly beautiful. And I went to them afterwards and said, could I work with them, um, thinking that I would design sets. And the very next day, I was a performance artist, and we played in Paris and London. And what was important for me about that experience was that they were, they were performances different from theatre because performance comes from conceptual art. And performance, the performance company was using the same material as I was using as an architect, furniture, rooms, spaces, people's reactions to each other. But they were able to look into those uh, uh, situations and people, and from the point of view of conceptual art, to see their value systems. And architecture wasn't doing that. Architecture in the 80s was still internally concerned with um, postmodernism, and so this let me make the Listen Gallery eventually. And there's an earlier Listen Gallery which nobody really publishes, which has got joined to the one that everybody knows. It's a shame because it was very uh, particular. And um, but the one that we made that everybody knows is um, it's a building that. that what I attempted to do is to make architecture not using conventional architecture. So I made a building, because I was very sensitive to um, uh, minimal art, for example, at the time. I was able, the building seemed to make itself, it was uncanny, it seemed to make itself out of the view and out of buildings which um, existed in the city which weren't um, proper architecture, like motor showrooms and industrial buildings. And they seemed to come together to make a building which um, described its place with some potency. And it's still true, people say that when they go there, they still get that feeling of uh, place. And what it, that building does, the Lesson Gallery does, is it shows you the city in Britain, or the British cities, London in particular, are um, in some ways they're catastrophic. You know, they're a real diagram of. Um, uh, liberal capitalism, and so, I mean, this wasn't deliberate. The view was there, and I could have covered it up or used it. But when you're in those rooms, you look at the art, and then you turn and you see the city, and it's framed. And the framing isn't judgmental. It says, "We all did this. This is what we believe in." And that, for me, seemed really an amazing opportunity. And that's because all of these thoughts came together. I was able to make a and really a, a huge change in the way that I thought about architecture. And that, that's where the work that perhaps you know me for has begun. But it's now, I'm now a kind of old bourgeois doing museums in the Danish countryside. And actually, I think you can still use the same inquiry. You can say that um, on, the one hand, on the one hand, you um, are making a building which is art in the sense that art provokes and asks questions, and on the other hand, um, uh, it's about use. We are going to talk about art, visions, and the transformations of sign. Mm. Uh, what does it mean? You, you are an architect, you mm. work as an architect, you design and you, um, you produce buildings. Which is the sign? Well, that's a rather interesting question. If we go back to the time when um, architecture was concerned with the issues of postmodernism, 
and people like Venturi were talking about science. I always found that uninteresting. It seemed very forced. I actually, I thought Venturi's very early work, the coffee shop and things like that, were much more um, punk, you know. And, um, and I, I met Denise Scott Brown recently, but I won't talk about it because it wasn't a very dis agreeable um, meeting. So she's not quite what we all thought she was. You know, they've become what they've become. But their early work was um, really exciting. But to, to go back to the issue of science, um, I suppose what I would say is that um, because I'm interested in making an architecture which I hope communicates with people, not everything, but in some way, that I, I'm interested in conventions. I'm interested in conventional understanding. So uh, some people are surprised that the Red House seems so historical. And um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But, but what I'm interested in and have been for a long time is the, the uh, relationship between abstraction and familiarity. So on the one hand, I use motifs that most people might understand you know, might recognize, and therefore you hope that the people that see the building or occupy it will have a connection with it. On the other hand, you, I abstract those things because you have, to, um, uh, dis you have to do that. You have to produce a kind of disorientation if it's to be art, if it's to say new things, if it's not to simply be um, conventional in itself. You have to abstract it as well. So these are the two forces that are in the work. So I would say, I don't think about it as science, I think about it as conventions, conventional material. And that's really performance, let me see that. How um, ideas exist in just ordinary objects, you know, value systems, and it's, it's there that I look for, um, for the material that I work with. Uh, you, you use different kind of materials, uh, blending <coughs> together um, the massivity of stone or maybe concrete, or the lightness uh, and the transparency of glass. Which role does material have in your designing process? Um, that's slightly harder to describe, and I think all uh, designers have um, they come to issue come to projects from from different parts of their mentality. One part is probably um, from the thinking that they're doing and the looking that they're doing all the time and the development of positions which they then apply to projects. <coughs> the other is um, uh, finding the pleasure and specialness in each project and, and each client. So these are the two factors I would say. But I, I, I would say that materials of course, they're very significant. You know, they probably have the most. The, the the thing that gives projects its most of its meaning. You know, is it a poor project, a simple project, a rich project? And materials are heavily conventional for uh, people. So I would say that that in looking at um, uh, a project, uh, uh, the materials will the possibilities of materials will come from from the idea of the project, what I want to say. But I am thinking, I've been thinking for a long time, after having done the Listen Gallery, which was intentionally insubstantial, I wanted to grow up as an architect and make really solid buildings, you know. I wanted to make incredibly expensive and long-lasting buildings. And in the Red House we did it, the client let us do that. We had bronze windows and um, Stone. My um, Belgian friend, um, uh, Christian Kiekens, who's uh, lovely but incredibly exaggerated, says, but it's the most expensive building in Europe. It isn't, by the way, but I mean, it's his story. And um, it's, uh, I mean, we had a, a very interesting client there, an art collector who's um, very wealthy um, and active, socially active. And um, it was in a street in Chelsea which, uh, where Oscar Wilde had lived, and um, so the street had a lot, a lot of uh, cultural history. But actually, as, as uh, an ensemble of architectural buildings, it was very poor, um, just as the area around the Listen Gallery is very poor. So there we were in a situation with a, a location, a site that we could build almost anything on. And um, gradually, I think, in the discussion with the client, we decided that we wanted to build a house in the European modernist tradition, you know, fantastically expensive and, and elaborate, and so we did. 
and that the, the municipality fell over backwards and didn't know what to do. And they said, "Didn't we want to make it a brick?" And we said, "No, we, you know, I can't just want brick." So it was an amazing opportunity, rare opportunity. But it meant that we used materials that weren't um, already in the surroundings. And the way that, if we're going to talk eventually about how the buildings that I make relate to their surroundings, um, for me it's important not to make work which is uh, in the spirit of, say, Dutch work, where it's a series of objects which have no connection to, visual connection to their surroundings. It's important for me that, that buildings that I make are have some continuity with their surroundings, especially in London, which it's, is always falling apart. It's always never coming together. And one of my missions is to kind of forcibly join it together. So we, we made a decision to use red stone. And of course, there was no red stone in the street. How do you make all of that work? Well, there's a, a Matisse painting with, um, which has got a, a bowl of goldfish and then a fig plant. and um, you think, how does this all work? And actually the fish are the same shape as the leaf and they're a different colour, but you know, painters somehow know how to put things together that, don't, um, that aren't composed and then compose them. And what you do as an architect is you look for things in the neighbourhood that you can make relationships to, make a, a red stone instead of a white stone because the street generally is red brick and so tonally it's, it's um, consistent. But making connections very important. We continuing to build the city is important for me. Coming from your British experience, <coughs> how did you approach your Dutch project for Andreas Ensemble in Amsterdam? It, uh, it represents also a jump of scale for you, doesn't it? it it's, yeah, it's a little bit bigger. Um, we, how did we... Well, it happened in that very casual Dutch way. Uh, I'm a professor in a Dutch university and um, we were recommended for that project. I happened to be on holiday in um, Amsterdam one Christmas, and the developer happened to be in Amsterdam at Christmas, and we went look, looked at the site and we got the job. So was, that's how things happen. You have a number of choices. Some uh, architects who are not Dutch and simply want to import their ideas into the country, and that creates enormous difficulties because each country has a different um, building culture. And Holland has a very specific building culture. Costs are low, uh, construction is very systematic. Um, but I like all of that. And in the same way as um, I spoke about looking at um, material, the material of performance artists and seeing its poetic possibilities, I didn't say that, but that's what I meant to say. Not only their political possibilities, but their poetic possibilities. It seemed to me that I could look at um, Dutch construction techniques and see their poetic possibilities. And I could do something that Dutch architects couldn't do because they were too close to it. Dutch architects can do wonderful work, but foreign architects can do extraordinary work in Holland. So um, we, were, we were very... Uh, uh, well, we liked the materials. We liked the simplicity of it. And that's also true in... Um, in Denmark, when we made the museum in Fulsang, um, that th there's a tradition of very good materials and very simply used and standard components. And that seems to me to be um, really interesting. So we worked with it. And what about the British Embassy in Warsaw, where you have to represent your home country uh, in Poland? Uh, considering the, the, the political differences between the two countries, well, it's very interesting. You, you, when you get an embassy, you think, well, there'll be um, cultural commissars in the British government who will say, hmm, now if you're doing an embassy, you know, a bit like Stalin coming to Eisenstein's set and saying, um, Russians will never do that, you would think that that would happen. Of course, it being England, it doesn't happen. And the British way of getting projects for embassies for a long time has been to commission significant designers and let them do what they want. The British position is not to um, represent some national identity in the embassies, but to show design. And that's unusual given, well, it's, you know, the, F, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office have been a very enlightened client. So you go through a, a competition process, but when you've succeeded, you, you build the building that you've designed. And they welcome good design and the relation with um, 
the uh, country that you're in, Warsaw, um, is that it's, a, it's an object, a, a strange object. It doesn't fit in. It's a strange object. It's a foreign country. It's uh, about the culture of the country of whose embassy it is. And that's true for all embassies. That's in all new embassy buildings for the last 50 years have been like that. If you go to um, Warsaw, the French embassy from the 1960s, it's an amazing Jean Prouvé-like um, structure. Um, the Dutch embassy next to ours in Warsaw is by Eric von Egerat. It's stuff everywhere, rather interesting. And um, that, that's how embassies work. It, it, it's, I suppose if you were in, um, in Russia in the 1950s, it wouldn't work that way. But, but in um, the free West, um, the unfree West, um, it, it's about being, a, a, let's say, representing your time and culture rather than your nation. So that's rather liberating. It's a facade with another building inside it. It's a thermal facade which controls heat and temperature, and the outside is um, rather uh, minimal glass, and the inside is much um, more solid because it has a blast resistance. And so it's a rather, it's a very minimal statement right next to Eric von Egerat's very maximal statement. So you could say there's something going on there. Um, could you describe your work in only one statement? Well, I think it's about a tension relationship with the art content of architecture on one hand, which is, um, this is five sentences, but um, one very long sentence. Um, the art content is about what architecture or any creative work uh, brings to society, the ideas it develops um, and the things it lets people see. Uh, on the other hand, in architecture, there's use and function a misuse, and it's the work that I make exists in a tension relationship between these two poles. That's where I think I stand. Thank you very much. Okay.